I, I really believe that God's put something in my heart for us, as a church, we are going into a season, we, twice a year, we do 21 days of prayer seasons. And in every January, we do 21 days of prayer and fasting. I mean, we have started our year that way for years and years here at the church. In fact, Lauren and I were, were doing 21 days of prayer and fasting before we were even pastoring the church. It was just has really become a part of the habit of our life. And then in August, kind of that late summer, early fall, uh, we do 21 days of prayer Again, as a church, the only difference is we do prayer and feasting. Can I get an amen, somebody? So, like, go home and eat your lunch today, okay? We're all, I actually had somebody come up to me after the, the second service today, and they're like, man, I was about to go and pick up groceries, but we're in 21 days. I said, dude, get your hamburger. You're going to need it. Like, <laughs> unless God tells you, don't fast. We're not, I'm not calling you to fast, but I am calling you to pray. I am calling you to find a place of prayer. So we're going to be praying for 21 days from August 12th to September 1st. But here's the idea. Listen to me. It's not so that we can just pray for 21 days. It's so that we can create habits in our lives so that we maintain and cultivate a prayer life day 22 and beyond. Amen, everybody. So I'm encouraging you in these next 21 days to be intentional, to find you a place of prayer. So typically in our 21 days, we would, we would have a prayer service every day at the church. We, every single day at something, we'd pick a time and we'd say, come on in and we'll pray right here. But we talked about it this past week as a team and made the decision. We said, listen, we, we actually want to help people really cultivate a prayer life of their own. And they need their own place. So we, we're, we're still going to have our same normal Friday morning, 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. That is a every week corporate prayer time. You all are welcome to come uh, in that time. We're going to maintain that. But we intentionally said, man, we just want to encourage our church, find your place of prayer. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of people refer to a prayer place as like a prayer closet. You ever heard of that? Uh, that's, that's a term. All right, it doesn't have to be a closet, but that's a term that describes a place of prayer. Uh, some of you may have already seen uh, our social media posts this morning from me in my garage. All right, and Every day, by the way, on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and our website, uh, we're going to post a video. It's, it'll be one minute or less from one of our leaders. Uh, we'll post videos that give you a little bit of an encouragement and then a prayer focus. We all can be praying the same agenda uh, for these 21 days. But I came to you from my garage this morning, and there's a reason for that. I, like That's one of my places. I, I'm comfortable there. Uh, it's, it's not always the cleanest place in the world because I got kids. Come on, everybody, right? But I like going into my garage. I have a shed that I like to go pray in. There's a couple trails around our community that when it is not August, I will walk down and pray. Amen. Uh, I know some people love walking the beach. Here's my point. Find a place. And I want to encourage you in these next 21 days to be searching to find you a spot where it becomes your place of prayer, where you cultivate your prayer life and, and it becomes yours. Amen, everybody. I, I want us to become a church. Uh, continue to become a church that prays. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to just tell you a couple little stories. Is that all right? And then we'll get, we'll get into the notes. You all right with anybody want a story? Come on. If you don't raise your hand, I don't know what to tell you because I'm going to tell this story. Okay. All right. <laughs> so uh, uh, the, the story goes, our church was born in November 1992. And, and obviously, uh, I am as young as I look. All right. I, uh, I, I did not plant the church, but it was born in prayer. And uh, years ago, our founding pastor, Pastor Tom, he just felt like God was stirring in his heart to do something. There was a stir going on, and uh, he went and just out of his own pocket, he just rented a, a local motel, and uh, he, he told the people, don't come in and don't clean it. Uh, I don't need you to see. I'm going to put the do not disturb sign on the door, and he shut the door, and he locked it. He said he unplugged the TV. It was him, a bed, some walls, and water was all he had. And for seven days, he sought God's face uh, in it. In, in prayer and total fasting, just water was he was taking in. And uh, toward the end of that fast, he, he said on the very last day, I don't know if you all ever feel like God's like last minute on you sometimes. And on the very last day, as he was about to walk out of that room, God just spoke into his heart and said, I want you to start a church and, and I want you to, to, to begin a church. And thus began Church on the Rock. And he was in our first service this morning and we got to have him stand and honor him and and celebrate the fact that we uh, really stand on the shoulders of his sacrifice and obedience before the Lord. And uh, in the first building the church ever had that was our own, uh, right on the face of the building uh, was the sign. It said Church on the Rock. And then underneath that, it actually said on the building, a, a, a house of prayer. This was a place of prayer. And it, I've been 19 years, I've been a part of this church. So it's very, uh, uh, very, very dear place to my heart. I've got a lot of great memories here. I was kind of raised up in terms of ministry here. And, uh, and I remember always, there was always a prayer time 
always a prayer time. And uh, it certainly changed. At one point, it was a Tuesday night, and I remember it being a Tuesday morning. And I remember there were times we would come in here at 6 a.m. in the morning, uh, just a handful of people, and we would be uh, in whatever building room or whatever. We would be in a place just calling on God in Prayer, it's always been a, a place of prayer. And, and in Lauren and I's lives, uh, several years back when uh, we were in our mid-20s and uh, we were approached by some, in fact, it was my sister uh, and my brother-in-law. And so they came to our house for dinner and they said, hey, uh, we just want to kind of challenge you guys to consider doing something. This coming January, we're going to be doing uh, 21 days of prayer and fasting. We do a Daniel fast, uh, which is horrible torture, everybody. I just want y'all to know that. And, uh, and they said, so we're going to be doing this Daniel fast. And we did it last year. Really, God just did something amazing in our, our hearts and lives. And we would love to challenge you to do it with us this year. And I'll be honest with you, I'm like sitting there eating whatever we were having, something fattening and delicious. You know what I'm talking about? I'm eating that, thinking of fasting, thinking like, I ain't doing that. You're crazy. I had written it off and they weren't even gone yet. I'm not doing that. And uh, so after they had left, Lauren came over to me. I don't know if it was that night or whatever, but sometime later, and she came, and she said, hey, I just want you to know, like, you know, whether you do it or not, it's up to you, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do this, to which I'm like, great. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to be having hamburgers while you're eating hummus, you know? Like, that's just not right, So, um, which is horrible by itself, by the way. Anybody hummus haters out there? Any hummus haters with me? Come on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I do not need chickpeas in my life. I just don't, all right? And uh, so, uh, w so she decides, let's do it. And, and I'll be honest with you guys, at that time in my life, I was like one foot in, one foot out. I don't know if you've ever been there. I was just sort of like uh, with uh, just mediocre at best with God, which is not a good place to be according to Scripture. And uh, here's the deal. I knew there was more. I just knew there was I'd experienced more. I'd had more. God had used me in great ways. Uh, and in that season of my life, I was just trying to sort of have my own thing and, and do a God thing too. And finally, when Lauren said, I'm going to do it, I just thought, man, I, I, I can't let her do this alone. And, and honestly, deep within my heart, I just knew. I said, okay, like I'm really not fully surrendered. So I went to a place of prayer and I told the Lord, I said, okay, God, I said, if, if I do this for 21 days, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it right. Like I'm going to honor you completely. I will do a Daniel fast. Help me, Jesus. Like I'll do it. <laughs> And I did, and, uh, and what God did, really in our hearts and, and lives, I, I have a bad tendency, Lauren, of saying my life, but really it was our lives. What God did in those 21 days uh, changed me forever. I've never been the same as a result of it, and, uh, and, and, I, and I aggressively work to maintain and protect what God did. Like, I don't ever want to get over it. You know what I'm saying? I want it to just get bigger on the inside of me. And then in time, we would become the pastors of the church. And then God would be calling us to, to uh, just be obedient and, and walk in obedience to him. And uh, we were in the kitchen yesterday, and we were just talking about sort of the timeline. And like, well, when, when did this happen? And do you remember that? And then we kind of determined like journaling is probably healthy. That would have been really smart for us because <laughs> it was so hard to remember how to line it all up. But there was one particular time where I was working and, and we were uh, really just started pastoring the church and I was full time. I would leave, I would leave town um, on a Monday morning to my job and I wouldn't come back till like Friday night or I would have to just get up every single day and, you know, really early and get home really late. Just traveled all week long and uh, we began to pray. Like obviously I can't serve a church being gone from it all the time and we just began to pray, God help us to know what the next step is and we, be we began to believe God to... Uh, to, to help us take the step to leave that job. Anyway, long story short, I'm going to make the I'm going to get to the point. Lauren came to me in December and she said, "Hey, I, th I think you should leave the job. Like, I think we need to just trust God by faith and you just take that step." And I was like, "Yeah, I don't know, man. I, you're crazy." And uh, and then we went into our 21 days of prayer and fasting again. And it was at the tail end of that that I really felt like God began to speak into my heart. And uh, I believed that God began to say to me, "I want you to start a prayer meeting at the church on Wednesday nights at seven. <laughs> And when I felt like that's what God was saying, I was thinking, well, I can't do that because I'm not in town Wednesday nights at 7. Uh, I'm, I'm gone somewhere. And I just felt like the, the, the Lord was pressing me, saying that you, you need to have a prayer meeting. To which, I don't know if you've ever argued with God. Maybe I'm the only one. But I'm kind of like, well, God, I can, I can pray from anywhere. Like, I can pray in a hotel. You know what I mean? You want me to pray there? Like, no, no, no. I want you in this, in this sanctuary. I want you in the auditorium. And I want you to be praying there. 
And that's what pressed me. Lauren had already heard from the Lord, and, and I'm, I'm slow in learning, everybody, and, 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 and understood that's what God was calling. And, and we stepped away from that work just for one reason, so that we could have a prayer meeting on a Wednesday night at 7. And I remember being in here oftentimes with just a couple of people, just a few people would come in here. And, and I tell you, to trade that kind of an income for that kind of attendance uh, to the natural eye wouldn't have made a lot of sense, but we knew it was what God said, and we knew it was what God called us to do. And I remember vividly uh, pacing. Pay, I'm a pacer. I like to walk when I pray, and I remember pacing up and down uh, this, this platform, it looked different at the time, but I would pace from one side to the other, and I would call on God for worshipers, because at the time, we didn't even have a praise and worship team, like at all. We would push play from a computer in the back and have, some of y'all remember that. How many, right? Art and Alice have been here for the whole journey, and, uh, and remember that, and you want to talk about stunting the growth of your church. Like, if, if you don't want to grow, don't have a praise team. Uh, just a tip, okay? And, uh, and it was tough, you know, watch it like, dude, we've seen this YouTube video like 47 times. Oh my God, I can't really get into worship anymore. I mean, it was just, it was a tough season, but we would call on God and believe God. And, and so for me, to, to see what God is doing in our church today and to know, I'll never get, I'll probably never get beyond the emotion of this conversation ever. To see what God is doing in our church today, I look back and I think of those seasons and those times of prayer. And the fact that the whole thing, the whole time was built on prayer. It started long before I was a leader here. It was built in prayer. And it was foundation was prayer. And, and here's what I want to kind of declare to you this morning, church. I'm like, it's like, we haven't arrived. Like, it's, this isn't it. We're just still on the journey. There is more. And there is more that God is calling us to. So I believe that no matter how many people are attending or how many lives are changing or how far we are reaching or how many missionaries we are supporting or, or whatever, as long as we are here on this earth, there are still lost people that need Jesus. So there is no such thing as an arrival place. So we must remain as desperate and committed to prayer today as we've ever been as a church. It's got to be a part of our everyday lives, not only individually, but corporately, because prayer is the birthing place for God to move. Prayer is the muscle that moves God's arm. There is something about when God's people will just get before him in prayer, there is something about it that moves the heart of God. And he'll say, I, I am going to respond on your behalf because you're lining yourself up with who I am and what I want to do. And when you get yourself in line with me, it is easy for me to resource you. It is easy for me to provide for you. It is easy for me to bless you. And what I want to declare and what I want to call us to in this season is not just, I don't want to just do 21 days. I want to do 21 days of prayer. Yeah. And I want you to find that place and cultivate, I mean, study it out and figure it out. Man, if it's not your garage, maybe it's your closet. If it's not your closet, maybe it's the cab of your truck. If, but but there's, there's a place for you. And I want to encourage you, watch one less sitcom in the evening. Maybe get up 15 minutes earlier. Maybe take your lunch break or whatever it is for you. There's no right place or right time. I mean, everybody's different, but I'm, I'm just encouraging you, find a place and pray and see what God would do. See what God might say and what he might lead you to do through these next 21 days. I, I hope you'll join me. And, and I want to show you in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, uh, this is popular to a lot of people, but maybe you've never heard it before. This is where I want to start. And the Bible says this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. And some of you in your relationships, you need healing in that land. Or maybe your business is the land that needs healing. It could be your body. Maybe it's your ministry. But there's a place in your life that your land is messed up and you need something supernatural. And you need something that is bigger than you. You need the power of the living God to move. And, and here's what I want to point out is that he starts the whole thing off with an if. Well, if you're willing to humble yourselves and pray and seek my face and turn. I want you to notice that the Bible says turn from some wicked ways. Like make some changes. Do some stuff different. It be, because if, if you want, I, I heard a preacher say it this way years ago and I loved it. He said, if you want Bible results, you're going to have to do Bible stuff. 
And and I'm telling you right now that sometimes God will lead us to do things that everything in our flesh wants to, like, I don't want to do that. I I, want to stay the course. I want to keep, I enjoy this or whatever. And there will be times that God will lead us and and our flesh just has to go before the altar to him and say, you know what, I'm going to turn from that. I'm going to make some change. God, I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to do it your way. And then all of a sudden the hand of God starts to move and heal the broken and desert lands in our spirits and our hearts and our relationships and our families and our businesses, all of a sudden we see the hand of God begin to move. Church, it's all in prayer. It is in prayer. So I want to teach a little bit. Is that okay? I want to give you a little bit of a breakdown this morning. And I want to show you in Luke uh, this really cool passage, and this really has inspired uh, what, uh, what, I want to, what I want to do with you today. The Bible says that one day Jesus was in a certain place, and, and, and I just we, we highlighted that. I want you to notice that he was in a he was in a certain place, and that, again, is why we're asking you to find your place of prayer in these 21 days. I, I need you to have a certain place. And the Bible says that he was in a certain place praying, and when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. And I don't think that the disciple was saying, teach me how to pray, I don't know how to say stuff. I think what he was saying was, teach us how to pray like that, because whatever it is that you do over there on that rock is amazing. And what I see God doing in your life, I want God to be doing in my life. So so Father, teach us to pray. And what I love about our church more than anything, I think, is that we have people on on all ends of a spiritual spectrum. Like we have people that are very seasoned, serve God a long time in their lives. Man, they know God's word and, and, you know, like they they can speak speak the Christianese. You know what I'm talking about? They've been around the church thing. And then we have people kind of in the middle and we have people that are brand new. And to them, it's like, man, I I don't know. Like I just committed my life to Christ. I don't really know how to, like, you're right here. You're like, well, teach me to pray. To help me out. And no matter where you are on this journey, I think we always can grow. I mean, I don't care if you're like the, like the greatest prayer warrior within our church. Man, we can always get better. We can always learn more. A- amen. But I feel like there's some of you in this room where you're just like, man, that sounds awesome. But I'm, like, I'm, I'm intimidated. Nervous. I don't know how to communicate to God. Well, I want to help you. Because Jesus responded to this by one of the most popular uh, uh, verses of Scripture. It is what we call the Lord's Prayer. We prayed it this morning during communion. We, we, we prayed that together, and then I don't know if you noticed the sermon intro video. It wasn't exactly the same words, but they were basically saying the Lord's Prayer in, in that video. And I want to take you to Matthew chapter 6 because uh, Jesus responded to the question, and he gave, he gave an answer. And what he said was, I want you to pray not these words, but I think what Jesus was saying is, I want to give you this outline. And I want to break it down for you today, and I want to help you with the outline. And he said, I want you to pray like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And a lot of people have taken this prayer and made it real kind of kind of ritualistic, you know, like, like, oh, well, that's my prayer, like I say, the Lord's prayer. But the Bible even warns us against prayers that are just vain repetitions. So it's really not about the words, it's about the heart behind the words. And so I think what Jesus was saying was, hey, I want you, what I want you to have is, is not necessarily, I'm not asking you to memorize something, I just want to give you an outline, a model on how your prayer life should look, and I want to break it down for you. And the first thing that he said, and you'll notice it, is that he said, our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven. And I just want you to notice this word, Father. He makes this connection to him. Write this down with me. Point number one is I want to encourage you that in your prayer time to start by connecting with God relationally. Because hear me, and and whether you believe it or not, this is true. There is a living God, the one true living God. And here's the most amazing thing about him. He wants to know you personally. Like a friend talks to a friend. This is his desire, is to have a relationship with us, not to have something not to have something where it's like, hey, I'm awesome, I'm God, and I'm strong, I'm powerful, and you better not mess it up, buddy. And, and some of us have this idea of God that way. I don't think God's that way at all. In fact, I think Jesus was saying, no, 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 he just wants to be your father. He wants to know you relationally. Watch what, watch what the, uh, the Bible says. Give me my verse. Real quick, Romans 8, 15. The Bible says you've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. You don't have to be afraid of God. 
You don't have to think that he's big and that, and that, and that he's going to get you. Like, that's not God's heart. In fact, the Bible says, instead, you've received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now, we call him Abba, Father. And the word Abba literally means Daddy. It's an endearing, personal term. And what Jesus was saying when the disciples said, hey, teach us how to pray, Jesus said, awesome. I'm, I'm so glad you're asking. The first thing that you should do is just connect to the heart of God in a relational way. He wants to spend that time with you. The next thing that Jesus said was uh, kind of, kind of a, a churchy word, I would feel like it is, but he, he said, hallowed be your name. Hallowed, which it's just odd, right? It's just not like we don't, I don't know how many of you guys go around using the word Hallowed uh, every day. Uh, but, but let me just kind of simplify it for you. It, it's just a word that means to just give honor to and to exalt and to lift up. And, and what Jesus was saying is, man, don't forget, even though God wants to be relational with you, don't forget that he deserves honor and that his name deserves honor, and that his name has power. So we should put him in a place where his name is lifted on high. Amen. So the second thing is this, that, that I believe that, that Jesus was saying, I want you to worship his name. So connect to him relationally, but then give him the honor due and worship his name. Just throw my verse up there for me. I'm going to have to move quick, so just try to stay with me. Proverbs 18, God's name is a place of protection. And I love that. And it says righteous people can run there and they're safe there. There's safety in his name. And, I, and I'm just encouraging you to, to find out, that as you continue to grow in your faith, find out what does the Bible say about the God that we serve? Who is he? Because the Bible gives him amazing descriptions. He carries different names. For, I'm going to give you a few. Can, can I do that? Like, for instance, the Bible teaches us that God, his, one of his names is our provider. And man, when I'm up against the wall and I, man, God, I need your provision. I don't know how I'm going to make the ends meet this meet. God, I know that I can call to the God who provides and honor that name. I, the Bible says that he is my righteousness, man. He makes me right. He makes me, he makes me what I can never be on my own. That is his name. He is the name of righteousness. The Bible says that he is our shepherd. It is his name. So he guides me into the places that I need to go. He guides me into safety. He guides me into hope. He guides me into growth. He shepherds me through this journey. The Bible says that he's our healer. It's one of his names. He is our healer. So when you are facing trouble and struggle, maybe in your body or in a relationship. God, I know that you are my healer, and by your stripes, I have been made healed. It's his name. Honor that name. The Bible says that he's our victory, that he is our peace, that he is our comforter, and I love this one. I love this one. You ready? The Bible says that he is the God who sees, and I love that. It's an incredible story. In the Bible of this amazing woman going through a lot of things, and she said, you are the God who sees me. And I know that in different seasons of my life, knowing, I mean, man, I, I would love to tell you that when we took that step, that faithful step, time to leave your job, and we, all right, Lord, let's do it. I would love to tell you that the church just tripled in size, you know what I'm saying? And then all of a sudden, everything just started working. No, no, we went into the one, one of the, the most difficult financial struggles of our lives, and it was no small season. Felt like it lasted forever. And I remember being in those seasons and being in those places where my world was just a fray. I couldn't understand it. I'm looking around saying, I don't understand why that is not working. I don't understand why I cannot pay that. I don't understand why that is going wrong or why this is happening. And I remember most times I would just stand before the Lord and I would just say, God, I know. I know that you have called me to this. I know that you have spoken into our hearts to be here and to do this. And while I don't understand the circumstances, I know that you are the God who sees me. And I know that you have called me here. So, Father, even though I wish you would fix this and I wish that would work out this way and I wish this over here would change, i got to trust you because I know that you are the God who sees me. And the first thing I should do is connect to him relationally. The second thing that I should do is exalt and worship his name. And then Jesus said, your kingdom come, your will be done. In other words, what he was saying was, I want you to pray his agenda first. It's the first, that, like his agenda has to be above your agenda. And, and this is the problem with a lot of our lives is that we're really not allowing God to have his way. 
All right, I'm about to preach because what we like to do, and I'm as guilty as anybody in this room, what we like to do is get God's benefits but do it our way. And here's what I want to say to you, and I love saying this, I say it to myself, that you can make excuses or you can make change, but you cannot make both. And there are often times where I'm just trying to do it my way, and then I'm looking for God to bless that. And what God is saying is, what Jesus was saying is, man, you've got to get your heart in line with him. It is his agenda that we should be praying for. And and let me tell you something. I'm going to give you a guarantee. You ready? It is a guarantee that I'm going to give you this morning. And here it comes, all right? What God wants for you, you want for you. I guarantee it. Because everything that God is going to call you to, there's fulfillment in it. Now, I didn't say it was easy, and I didn't say you're always going to like it, but I promise you, you're going to want it. Because when I look back on some of the seasons of my life, and I look at those frayed, difficult, hard times, struggles, and some of the things where I just couldn't understand for the life of me, I could not understand the scenario that I was in. To, To walk to where God has called me to today, I wanted what God wanted for me. And I look back on those seasons, and I can tell you lessons. I didn't even, I didn't even know I was being educated then. But I look back and say, oh, oh, if not for that season of my life, I wouldn't know how to handle the season that I'm in. Let me, let me, this is a bonus for you. Because what God gives you now and what you do with what God gives you now will determine what God gives you next. Because some of us want more, but we won't even be faithful in what we have. Man, I want to preach a minute. I, a couple of years ago, I was before the Lord. It was in 21 days of prayer. I, I promise I'm not just trying to make up stories. Uh, we were in 21 days of prayer, and I was calling on God, and I was saying, God, I, I was praying one of my dream prayers. And one of my dreams is that I, I love leadership. I eat it up. I love leadership books, teachings, lessons. I, I, I love being a leader. And I was praying before the Lord, and I said, God, one day, I just want to lead leaders. Lord, give me an opportunity to make investments into leaders. And then the Lord prompted, he, he put a question in my heart. And the question was this. He said, what are you doing with the leaders you have now? And the reason that he asked me the question, how many of you know God never asks you a question because he don't know the answer? <laughs> Ever. And the reason that he asked me that question is because he needed me to see that the answer was not enough. So I could make excuses, or I could make change, but I couldn't make both. I, both I needed to get my life in his agenda, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus prayed that in the Garden of Gethsemane before he went to the cross to pay, pay, pray, to pay for our sins. He was kneeling down there saying, Jesus, or he was saying, Father, if, if there's any way this cup of suffering can pass from me, that'd be awesome. This is the Pastor Josh paraphrase version. That'd be really sweet. But then he said, not my will but yours be done. God, I just need to align myself with your will. We know this first, moving on real fast for time, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. First, the kingdom. The, the next thing that Jesus would say in this prayer is he said, give us this day our daily bread. And number four, what I think that Jesus is teaching us here is that we need to learn to depend on him for everything. Just depend on him for everything. If you're anything like me, I oftentimes learn or have, or have found myself in places where I'm depending on me, like too much, like, oh, I can get it done, or I'll do this, and, and I'm really not trusting the fact that, God, you have everything in control, and really, God, you don't really need my help, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I think you got this. What you need is just my obedience. What you need is just me to do what you're asking me to do and what you're calling me to do. Psalm 121, I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? Mm -mm. My help comes from the Lord. And too often times, man, we're just trying to take things our own strength, do it our own way. And I think, by the way, if you're in ministry, serve in ministry, hope to be in ministry, I think it's one of the greatest dangers in ministry is that too, and I've said this before, and I have to check my heart all the time. It is easy to get so focused on the work of God that we forget about the God of the work. God, I'm just doing, and I think of that scripture where, where Jesus said that there are going to be people that, that, that walk up to him and say, what's up, man? I'm ready to come into heaven. And he's going to say, oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I never really knew you, but I did this in your name, and I did this in your name, and I did this in your name. I know, but there was no relationship. I, I don't even know who you are. And I constantly have to check myself. God, I need to depend on you, not on me. Because I promise you, my limitations are extraordinary. <laughs> But when God uses us, 
the things that he can do through us, they are remarkable. They are remarkable. Amen. Amen. The next thing, I got to move on y'all for time. I promise I got to. And some of you guys are saying, preach, preach, or preach. But everybody watching your children's right now are saying, come on and wrap this thing up. Amen. All right. (laughs) The next thing that Jesus would say is this, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us like Man, help me get my life right, and then help me to be a forgiver. Write this down, that number five, we've got to get our hearts right with God and people. God and people. After preaching today, I almost wish I'd have highlighted the people part. (laughs) And what he's saying is, hey, 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 make sure that when you're in that time of prayer that you're just checking your heart. Make sure you're getting your heart right before the Lord. And sometimes, y'all, listen, there are times, you know we're imperfect, right? And you know we're all sinners, and you know we all have issues. Amen? All of it. la di da everybody, okay? In the whole room, all of us have our issues. So there are definitely going to be those times where we're going to the God saying, look, I, like, I, I messed it up in traffic, and I probably shouldn't talk to my wife that way. And, right? And it's easy. Like, we come up, and then there are going to be other times where we're, we're just going to have to search our heart. And King David said that, search me and see if there be any wicked way in me, right? And there are going to be times where we have to just go before the Lord and just say, God, if there's anything in me, would you please show me? God, is there anything I'm, I'm ignorant to? I don't even know I'm doing that you want to change in me. God, would you allow me to see that? And then there are going to be those times where God's going to say, yeah, and it has to do with relationships, which is when I've got to go get myself right with some people. And I just want to encourage you, some of you, some of the greatest homework you can have is to leave this place, get before the Lord, and then go make some apologies to some people. Because if you're one of those, if you're one of those, and I know it's not any of you sitting here, so I'll just talk to everybody watching online, okay? If you're one of those that you say, man, I love God, but I don't love God's people, I'm going to tell you something, you don't know God's heart. Because God's all about the people. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. He emphasized his love. It's an extravagant love. So, so if, if you can't love people, man, First John tells us that. If, hey, if you, if you can't love people you can see, how could you even possibly love a God that you can't see? I just feel like T.D. Jake's preaching in this place right now. I do. Amen. I, I'm just challenging us. Listen, our prayer lives, it, it's birthed, it's born, it begins in prayer. First John 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And man, all I have to do to get my heart right before God is just be a repentant heart because he's faithful and he's just. And I'm going to tell you something right now, that there are times that I, I have this verse to memory. I have James 5, 16 to memory. And I'll go before the Lord sometimes when I know that I've blown it. And, and I, I don't know if you're like me, but there are times where I'm ashamed. So I feel like I don't deserve the right to go to God because I knew better to begin with and I probably shouldn't have, but then I did. And how can I approach him? Because he's awesome and perfect. Come on, am I the only one in the room? And what I'll do is I'll quote 1 John 1, 9 in my prayer and I'll just say, God, I don't feel like I deserve any kind of forgiveness. I don't feel like I deserve any kind of mercy. I deserve you to just pound on me for a while. However, your word says that if I confess my faults to you, you're faithful and just to forgive me my sin and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. So God, I just stand on 1 John 1, 9, and I receive your forgiveness for me. And then we talked about getting right with people, right? And the Bible says, James 5, 16, that if we confess our faults one to another, that we will be healed. The Bible says if we confess our faults and pray for one another, we will be healed. So I got to go to God for forgiveness. I got to go to his people for healing. So stop burning all those bridges. Get your heart right with God and people. Amen. Amen. All right, we got to move on. I promise. I got to quit, y'all. Number six, Jesus said, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Number six, we, when we are praying, we are engaged in spiritual warfare. This is a battle. Let me tell you something that's true. There is a God, one true living God, and he has an agenda and a plan and a purpose for your life. Let me tell you something else that's true. There is a devil who is the enemy of your soul, and he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And he is not going to sit back and watch you just move forward and grow in God and get nearer to the heart of God and just sit back and let that happen. He is going to fight you. He is going to come against you. He's going to do anything he can do. The the Bible says that his purpose is to kill, steal, and destroy. He's going to do anything that he can do to ruin the progress that you are making in that relationship 
relationship with God. So in my prayer time, I've got to be a warrior. And there are times that I've got to tell the enemy who I am in Christ Jesus and let him know I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. And I, I am an overcomer because of him. We as believers do not have to fight for our victory. We get to fight from it. Like the battle's already won. And, and, and I've heard, maybe you've heard the old preacher say that if Satan ever tries to remind you of your past, just remind him of, your, of his future, right? Because he knows what his end is. And he understands. So when I get sometimes in prayer, I just like to tell the enemy what, what I know God can do in me, even when I don't believe it. Even when I don't feel like I'm winning, I'll declare that I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus because I'm going to receive this book by faith. I don't always have to feel it. I don't always have to like it. Man, I just need to receive it and stand on it and declare it and let it just become what it becomes on the inside of me because I'm telling you, heaven and earth will fade away, but his word will remain forever. Get some warfare. Get you some verses and start praying those verses. That's why I memorized 1 John 1, 9. It's because the enemy's tactic to keep me out of a relationship with God was shame. How dare you? How dare you? And then I just say, "Mm -mm. I'm going to pray the word of God. And the word says that if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me. In your face. That's how I feel. (laughs) That's how I feel. Because Satan wants me to be isolated. He wants me to be separated from the heart of God. I'm not going to let him do it. Even when I feel like I deserve separation, that's not God's plan for me. Amen. Amen. He finishes this way. He finishes this way. He says, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Number seven, write this down as we close, that we need to express faith in God's ability. Express faith in God's ability. It is not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. God, I know that you are able, and I know that you are strong, and I know that you can do anything through me and in me. It is your strength, and it is your power. And I'm just, I'm just encouraging the church that in your prayer life and in your prayer times, begin to declare the word of God. Begin to speak life to yourself. Begin to, begin to build yourself up in your holy faith. And let, let, man, let the word of God begin. And I'm not saying, you know, name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, spit it, get it. And I'm not saying all that. What I am saying is that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And begin to proclaim just the the, the faith in God's ability to do through you what you could never do through yourself. Come on. And just say, God, I trust you. You are strong and you are able. And Father, I know that I'm more than a conqueror. I know that I'm victorious because of you. I know that you carry me. I know that you cover me. You are my, my shield and my protector. Father, I know who you are. And you can do all things. Amen. Amen. Gosh, we gotta quit. Listen, with every head bowed and every eye closed. Come on, help me. Help me quit. I want to ask you to just, right there in your seat, I just want you to look inside your heart and just reflect. This, what you're doing right now, is a very healthy habit. We constantly should look in our hearts. We constantly should be checking ourselves. Father, what is it? What is it? Some of you are in this room right now, and you've never had a personal relationship with God. You've never had it. And what I want to say to you this morning is you can have it right now. Jesus said there's only one way to know the Father, and that is through him. In fact, in the book of John, chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said these words. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody can come to the Father except through me. And you might be in this room this morning, and you say, man, I need that relationship. I need to know that that." Abba Father, that Daddy. I need that personal closeness, Pastor, that you talked about in point number one. That's what I need. Well, I'm I'm telling you, you can have it. You can have it because Jesus made a way for you. What I'm going to ask you to do here in just a minute, I'm not asking you to stand or come to the front. I just want to ask you to say a prayer with me because the Bible says that if we will confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts the Lord Jesus, we will be saved. And and that's why I want you to pray. And I'm actually going to ask everybody in this room to say the prayer with me. But for some of you, this is going to be a very deep, very meaningful moment. Because for some of you, this is the first time your heart has ever declared this prayer. So as I lead you, I want you to say these words and mean them in your heart. Come on, everybody help me. I want you to say, dear Jesus, I give you my life. 
Wash me of my sin. Cleanse me and purify me. Make me new. I want to know you personally. My entire life is yours. Have your way in me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.